where are you going? The known path or your own path? Iona College is where you'll be given the means to dream and find meaning in your dreams. To serve while you learn and learn while you serve. To fight the good fight and to own your path. So where are you going? Iona College, learn outside the lines. And welcome back to the EGFC. It is week 13, and we are getting ready to wrap up the regular season. This is the start of the kind of end of the regular season. Only a few games are left after this. My name is Soy. Joining me for the first match of the day is Dill, our producer. Dill, how's it going? Hello. Yeah, um, I'm here casting again. Have a pretty good day. Uh, yeah, let's see what we have going for today. Yeah, this is a kind of stacked schedule, as we mentioned. This is really the, the final stretch. After this week, teams will only have three games remaining. We've got a MAC battle to start the day between Iona and Siena. Later on, we get the Independent Conference Championship rivalry between DePaul and Colorado. Then we get to, uh, to see a newcomer in South Alabama going up against St. John's. We end our day with a Western battle, Weber State taking on Montana. You know, definitely some good matches today. I'm personally most interested in DePaul versus Colorado. I feel like they must have had pretty, I don't know, pretty significant matches in previous splits, right? Both being kind of bigger dogs in this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, DePaul, I mean, they were, you know, the independent conference champions last year. They went up against Colorado, won that game. They lost to Colorado in the regular season of uh, season two. And then when it came down to the national bracket, they played against each other again in semifinals. DePaul got the better of them in that set. So really, historically, between the two of them, it's two to one in favor of DePaul. This is round four, I guess, <laughs> or in, uh, in sorts between those two. But that is our second match of the day. Iona versus Siena has some interesting implications for playoff uh, picture because Siena, they took their first loss not so long ago against Quinnipiac, and in the MAC conference, it's very much so a top-heavy conference where the top two teams only have one or two losses. But Iona is in this middle ground at four and four where if things start to go their way, they may, may or may not have a, a slightly easier schedule down the line. If they can string together some wins, they might be able to sneak that second or third seed from one of these top teams. But in order to do so, they're going to have to beat Siena today. You know, Iona is definitely like one of those schools to like watch out for. Like they're not really in that dominant spot right on the top, but they definitely feel like they're capable of like sneaking wins on people. They are very interesting to watch and joining as of this split. You know, it feels like they just kind of have this strategy of let's see if we can end the game quickly or not by sending in some of our best players first and then, you know, trust the depth of the, the lineup to be able to hold on. Sometimes it's worked, sometimes it hasn't. They are overall six and six uh, on the season. If you go down the line uh, to our later game, South Alabama versus St. John's, that's another uh, in-conference matchup that could be very fun to watch because South Alabama as a newcomer to the EGF, they had kind of a streaky start. It was, they had, you know, ups and downs, and it's been one of those seasons for them where they've either won big or lost big, really. And St. John's is in a similar fashion, but their wins have been massive. We're talking, you know, averaging, you know, 30-ish point victories on some of these other schools, uh, ex uh, excuse me, especially in conferences like the Big East. But South Alabama, no slouches themselves, and they could really use some wins to try and get into that playoff race. And then lastly, Weber State versus Montana, two newcomers to the EGF. 
uh, thanks to the, the signing of the Big Sky Conference, they joined that central division in Smash. So their schedules have been shortened, which means their uh, potential to get into the postseason is based off of their win percentage. So these games for them are are vastly more important. They don't have quite the the depth that a lot of these other schools have. They just have eight games to try and sneak their way into the playoffs. So a very impactful match between these two. And that will be our last match of the day. But to start it off, we're getting into our first match between Jack Boz for Iona. And it is Waffle for the side of Sienna. Three, two, one, yeah, it was go! Aegis and Sonic. Pretty fast paced. Uh, two characters who can actually really stay, you know, they can get into each other's space, you know? Like, a lot of the time, characters like Aegis can, well, Mithra at least, is just gonna, like, run back and forth in neutral, and it's really difficult to get a hit out. But then Sonic actually has the, the potential to sneak in a, a hit there. Good combo string right there from Waffle. And Jack Boz, we really haven't seen a ton of him this year. This is only, I believe, his fourth game of the EGF season. And all of them coming, really, in this spring split. So seeing a lot more time and had a decent amount of success as Jack Boz is... Uh, excuse me, one and two on the season. Got the one win over... I believe it was Crystal Rose in that Quinnipiac matchup. The Waffle has had a fantastic season so far, but we haven't seen him recently. He's 10 and 0. Or sorry. He is 7 and 0 on the season, so making one of his first appearances here in the spring split. Yeah, definitely one of the bigger hitters for Sienna. Uh, maybe a little bit surprising that uh, Iona did not choose to like start with someone who's has a better record because I feel like that's pretty common. But yeah, definitely. Good. Uh, the, the matchup is interesting though because like you can like really see Sonic. It does control the pace, which is something Aegis is not really used to dealing with. It's like she needs to follow him as he just goes from left to right. Ooh, but the down air sneaking that one in, catching Waffle. A little off guard there, and stock number one off the board, but Jack Claus, I don't think he had his jump, and he's not going to be able to recover in time, so things back to even. Yeah, it was definitely an unfortunate, not not really an SD on Jack Claus's part, but did not realize that he didn't have a jump by the time not doing the side B just left it too late for him to make it back. Ooh, Jack Claus trying to call out the, the charge there on that roll, and was not able, <clears throat> excuse me, not able to do so. But Waffle, I think, is really starting to get a feel for this matchup. He's starting to connect a lot more of these combos. And Jack Boss is, it still feels like he's struggling to, you know, pick and choose his time to, to find those hits. I think it's interesting because you can actually really see Waffle. Waffle's kind of gone from the first game more like playing a little bit more keep away, playing more slowly, trying to see how his opponent's going to approach. And now he's really just dashing in pretty often consistently, just taking taking openings. Like I feel like he's become confident. It's like where the holes in Jack Boss's gameplay is and where he can get some damage out of it. And you're seeing that through the, the number of combos he's been able to land. I like that kind of tricky setup there, but does not land. Jack Boss did lose his stock to the, the spring there, so a little bit of missed tech, but Jack Boss still could get some work done here. And even now, you know, the, the switching between Pyra and Mithra, it feels like he's sort of at a, a loss of, you know, do I try and get the kill now or do I need to rack up more percent? He's got Sonic up to 102, and Pyra's got a lot of kill power, but now it's going to be easier for Waffle to track him down. Switch back to Mithra as he's along the ledge. Those back airs starting to really land their, or excuse me, find their mark. But this is a very important stock for these two, and Waffle continues to work away at it. Yeah, it's definitely kind of just a scary situation, especially when you've lost both your stocks to to just like Gimp's off stage. It can be a little threatening to feel like you're going to bring this all the way back. 
That back air won't connect from Jack Boz, but that down air will. Waffle will survive, not the spike hitbox. And along the ledge once more, both playing dangerously at these high percents, 124 to 122. Ooh. But the run up, up smash from Waffle, just a call out, ends up taking the stock, and Waffle takes game one via two stop. Yeah, that call out on the Pyramithra swap was actually really nice. It's not really something I'd imagine someone would go for. And yeah, let's, let's see that again. It's like, yeah, really just. Uh, typically, what you want to do is you want to, like, you know, run up. You want to, like, jump away while doing that just to make it a little bit safer. But y no one really expects full screen. Oh, yeah, Sonic is the one character who can actually challenge you here. Yeah. And, uh, again, I, I feel like you started to see it as that match was going on. Waffle certainly, like you said started to get a feel for the matchup of, hey, I can land this combo here, I can do, you know, this or that, and then just go back to, you know, my side of the stage and, you know, rinse and repeat. Whereas Jack Paws, you know, once he lost that second stock, seemed like he was kind of at a loss for, you know, where to be and what to do. The constant switching of, you know, all right, all right I'll bring out Pyra, even though, He's only at 60-ish percent. All right, I'll switch back to Mithra, even though he's at 115 or so. It's uh, it felt like the the game plan for Jackpot was just got a little a little uh, mixed up. Oh yeah, so here you can see like where the jump got stolen was actually right. Like this is actually a really just difficult position to be in. So as you can see, lost the ability, lost the jump right early, like right away. Like, literally, like, while like jumping right above on the, uh, stage still, yeah. Yeah, on the, like, right above this this platform. Yeah, had been off stage for so long. And then it's just like, oh, wow, you don't realize that this is where you are. Losing a stock to a really tight call out like that. Uh, I mean, it just means that it's Waffles... It's rough. Yeah, no, Waffles really... Like, Waffle's very clearly making, like, soft reads on where Jackpots is going to be. Not just, like, playing whiff and punish, but, like, actually going in there and seeing, like, hey, I think you're going to jump here. Making those call-outs is a great way to, like, steal those stocks early. So, like, that's something that especially Sonic can kind of struggle with, is playing too safe and too consistent. But Waffle, 7-0 and o for, a, yeah, 7 and o for a reason, definitely knows how to pick into people and waffle was one of those players last year for sienna that kind of had his ups and downs for those reasons right sonic could get a bunch of damage on the board but when it came to taking stocks that's where waffle tended to struggle to see that waffle is able to you know kind of snipe stocks seemingly out of nowhere now is part of the reason why he is you know seven and oh and it also goes back to another point uh, Waffle, not typically the player that Sienna sends in first into a matchup. Waffle's typically in more impactful spots, you know, the third spot where you can really shift the momentum of the match or the anchor spot. Not able to get that edge guard though, but Jackpaws is still in a bad spot. He's able to snap the ledge, but he's at 142. And the follow-up. Oh, he had the air dodge, and he didn't get the grab in time. Just didn't dash far enough. He's trying to call out Jackpaws, but just can't catch him quite yet. Yeah, I definitely think player order is always really interesting in the EGF. Because it's like, you know, obviously everyone plays. So it's really just like, what do you think is going to give your team comfort? Maybe, you know, they're so confident that Waffle can like create that nice, solid lead that it might just alleviate tension off of other players. But of course, you know, if it stays even and then you have a not as strong anchor, it can definitely start feeling a lot of pressure on your team. It's always complicated on how you want to do it, just to like keep team morale where it needs to be. And every single stock does matter in this format too. So Jackpot's dropping the first one there. Trying to find a way to answer now as he's got Waffle at a high percent. Pyra's online, side B hits, but won't be able to take the stock quite yet. And Jackpaw is still 
eating some combo. Oh, that was a, a dangerous early air dodge, and Waffle nearly caught him again. And Waffle now feels like this is a lot of just kind of whip punish. That upbeat connected. That is a wild hitbox, but the up tilt will take the stock, and things are back to relatively even. Yeah, that's definitely the kind of position. Like, you could see Jackbuzz was, like, throwing out those pyro tilts and, like, it's finally a kill percent, but it's so hard to get your opponent where you want them. But then that up tilt, they're landing on you. It's just like, okay, finally have more control over, like, where he's gonna be by getting, like, under him while he's landing. Jackbuzz with stage control at the moment, but Waffle is the one setting the pace of this matchup. Followed up with the up air. The nair connects as well for smash, and now these air dodges are really starting to get red. And the pineapple underneath the stage will seal the deal. Jack Boz will fall. It's another two stock for Waffle. Yeah, that was... That spring game to go under the stage was really nice for Waffle, because it's like that's the kind of situation that's really finicky, like... Was there a possible tech? Oh, did not go for the air dodge at all, which is smart. Because that's a really common thing people do when they get knocked in the stage. It's like, oh, you accidentally air dodge, but you're at low enough. You're at too low of knockback. But didn't have to struggle with that. But yeah, it's just a really tough spot to be as a character like Mithra. Probably just couldn't do anything. If anything, you'd have to wait a little bit longer to try and drift under the stage. But it's so stressful in that moment when you just want to get back on. This first stock was actually, interestingly, like you see, this is probably the only time that Waffle really struggled to get the kill until late in the stock. Yeah, no, Jackboss did do a good job of surviving, uh, at least to the higher percents in, in this game, but still not quite able to to get the job done you saw they were able to take that up tilt and get uh their only stock i guess of game number two off of the board yeah. but it was definitely a nice up tilt you know a little dash back dash in action but yeah unfortunately the only one that uh jack balls could find this turning point really is like you know like you just got the stock on Waffle, you need to like get back. Ends up doing the side B early, feeling like, oh, that's Sonic in tumble. What's gonna happen? But then you just, you lose your stock early and all the comeback potential really starts to go away. Cause now it's like zero to zero going into the last stock. Difficult to make a comeback there. Oh my God, that's actually such a clean sequence. Just this entire stock. It's like, just carry it off, read the air dodge, get them off stage. And then with that spring gimp sealing it off, yeah, that would have been very difficult for Jack Boz to, to get back under the ledge where he needed to be. A very, very harsh angle there too to try and, like you said, get back to ledge. Six points on the board there, and credit where credit's due. I think Waffle really kind of over uh, he he adapted and overcame in that matchup, and he did it almost on a dime really after losing the first stock of that match he just kind of flipped the switch and you were talking about the control of the pace of play in that that first game and it did feel like waffle had control of the pace of that game really after that dropping that first stock the second he dropped it he was able to answer right back and then he just never let go of the lead mm -hmm. okay you know, it's, it's, it was definitely hard, uh, especially against Sonic. It can be very difficult to get a lead back because, you know, he he's all about speed. He controls the pace. That's his character. And, yeah. Um, we're actually going to go to a quick break. And then we'll be right back with the next set of Iona versus Sienna.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the EGFC. Now joining me for the rest of this match will be Cosmos. Cosmos, how's it going? Oh, well, I'm glad to be here. Looking forward to seeing some high matches. Yeah, and uh, so our first match uh, between these two, we did set number one. Waffle took the set over Jack Boss. They earned themselves six points via two, two stocks. Now we are getting ready for the second battle between these two. Yaliso being locked in for the side of Iona and Lax, it looks like going to be the player for the Saints. So Yaliso, he is this uh, meat fighter player that's been kind of the go-to guy for Iona. Seven and three on the season. We've seen him use all of the me fighter variations, the brawler, the gunner, uh, the sword fighter. So curious to see which one he brings out today. Whereas Lax, we've almost exclusively seen Fox. I think we've seen a little bit of Falco in the past as well, but I think it's almost exclusively this season been Fox. So a very different style of matchup that we don't typically see here at the EGF. Yeah, I'd personally like to see, well, uh, close to what I was going to say. I wanted to see Fox versus Brawler because they're very similar characters right up in each other's faces, but we still get some of that with Sword Fighter, so we're getting right into game one. Lax the Fox and Yaliso on the Mi Sword Fighter, and immediately my mind thinks about that shine because this Sword Fighter is going to throw a lot of different projectiles that Lax is going to have to worry about, and the best way to deal with that is going to be that Reflector, but you can tell both of them playing very cautious off the start. Yeah, I'm pretty interested to see if he gets to Reflect on the short version of the Trocrum because he could definitely get some combos off of that with Fox. We see he's opted for the, uh, the Mario Cape down B. I'm not sure the technical term is for it, but uh, that would be pretty cool if we got to see like a, a fox side be reflected with that, but it's unlikely that some like... I think it's Tornado. interesting that, that we're seeing the, the down B of Yaliso come out, you know, in the air when it right when it feels like Lax wants to approach and he's almost able to follow up off of it himself. Yeah, absolutely. And... Uh, Yalisa looking, uh, actually didn't commit to that advantage, just, uh, just faded back, looking to cover things. It can be tricky with Fox because even if Fox is in disadvantage, you want to juggle him. He can be coming down with those Nairs, which can set up for kills pretty soon. Uh, and about like one more hit, it'll be a, a kill percent for Nair up smash. Fox off stage is the bad spot, of course. And Yalisa opting to just go for that tornado. That one was just a little bit too late at that point, and uh, he's able to grab the ledge and make it back on. Lax has got to be careful here. He's at 117. Good parry. Can't quite get the follow-up, though. Only a little bit of damage done, and the falling up air ends up taking the first stock. Yeah, I actually like the reaction right there, because, again, like we were talking about, Fox is looking to land on you with a lot of nares like he was going for right there, especially at this percent. Yaliso capitalized on that perfectly with the falling up air. X is a defensive and offensive tool at the same time. Kind of the overshoot dash attack right here, but no follow-up. Lax still, again, trying to pick and weave his way in. I like the wait there to get that up smash, but it doesn't take the stock quite yet. Yaliso just kind of stalling out here. Yeah, Good that's unfortunate because quarter. in that position, like now Yaliso's extra expecting up smash. Probably be looking for that anyway, but he's gonna be a lot more careful on his landings uh, to avoid that. And well, as I say that, Miss Space Nair probably looking for a cross up there based on the way that he's positioning with that. Um, still a lot to make up, but Fox can turn this in, into one big uh, opening. Turn this damage out from one big opening if he gets a chance. Lax at 85. We'll see if he can find that opening. Yaliso is not making it very easy, though, to get in. Lots of projectiles to deal with, always constantly in the air. Good down air, though. This could be a good combo. I think he wanted the drag down of that forward air and couldn't quite get it, but he will be able to land, and the chase down continues. And once again, that forward air just not quite finding its mark, but yaliso has got no time to react, but that back air gets him out of dodge. Yeah, like you were saying, yaliso has been so tricky with his movement, his projectiles in general. It's just been really hard for the Fox to get in, and that's exactly what you want as Fox, is just head in, get that momentum started, get a big jump coming out. But that greedy uh, <laughs> up smash is going to give Lax a chance to finally get in, but not able to get much off of it as we've seen. He hasn't really been able to get any kind of crazy up air strings. It's just going to be like one dash attack into a follow up uh, and not enough to really convert into a stock. I think part of that is because of that reflector and other things that we've seen. You know, he finds the hit to get them up into the air, and you know Fox wants that juggle, but yaliso has been very smart knowing, hey, he's going to go for this up air, and usually throws out something to try and counter that option. So now Lax has been forced to play more passive, and yaliso has been able to capitalize off of it there with that back air. 
Yeah, I love the way Yulisa was like drifting out at first on the first short hop to make it seem like Fox had a chance to get in and then drifted back towards him, trapped him in the corner and then got that back here to close out the stock. Picking movement in general is what we're seeing. Uh, also, these air dodges, though, is something that Lax has been doing a good job of capitalizing on when Yulisa's landing. He does have this pattern of where he's going for neutral air dodges, um, but we haven't been able to just see a big enough punish to make a, a significant impact. Yulisa not going for uh, a follow-up that he didn't have there, waiting to bait out a defensive option. Gotta play carefully here. Yulisa is at 98, and remember, every stock matters in this format, so Yulisa right now... Gotta play very careful around this corner. I like the idea to go for the up smash, but Yaliso the patience once again as he's able to use that forwarder to get back to stage. Yeah, this is one of those situations where if Lax takes the stock, it's almost an even game. Just because when you're at 0%, your opponent hits you, they get so much momentum off of it. They can turn it into so much, whereas it's not that easy to find a kill from neutral. Uh, as we say that, though, Lax has to make it back on stage first if he wants to get anything like that done. And the back air on that shine stall is going to close out a solid game. At least they're taking game one. A two stock fashion, so put two points on the board for Iona. And they start to work their way back into this lead. I like the idea there from both players. Yaliso, he'd thrown so many projectiles on that edge guard in particular that you felt like another one was coming. Yeah. And Lax reacts with that shine, and that's the one time Yaliso ends up throwing out that, that deadly back air hitbox. Yeah, Yaliso was just covering stuff so well, making it really hard for Lax to get in. And you could tell Lax never really felt comfortable, like, getting his forward momentum, moving forward, kind of finding his way in. Uh, like, even right there with the, the shine, it was active to be, or, you know, acted, used to be a reflector, but he's also kind of just afraid to get close. Every time, even the last time he took, uh, he lost his stock at the ledge, wasn't running in, and Yaliso just kind of let him feel trapped there by covering the roll distance so well, and then drifting back in with the back air both uh, in both circumstances. It was, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel like Lax was starting to kind of get a handle on it, especially toward the middle portion of that set, right? He drops his first stock, but then he's able to find that up smash. He's able to, you know, find some early combos on that second stock. But, you know, Foxes have got to be able to confirm those kills. And Yaliso, like we said, just made it so difficult. Final Destination, the site of game number two. Remember, if... Yaliso wins this one, he wins the set and gets those extra two bonus points. If Lax wins, we go to game number three, but FD, I'm not sure about this stage. While you do you know, get a lot of advantage out of it, those projectiles become even harder to avoid without any platforms to, to move around. Yeah, but on the other hand, having no platforms means you can't just sit under a platform and like use it as an umbrella so that way someone can't get you from above. And uh, one of the weaknesses of projectiles, at least in the case of the ones that uh, Swordfighter here has, is that you don't have anything to defend yourself from above when you throw them. And what does Fox like to do? He loves to drop down on you with those nares, with those down airs. Uh, also, it's not like Lax was getting too many like upper ladders with the platforms. So I think this might just give him more freedom to move around the way he wants and the pressure from different angles. You're starting to see a little bit of that now. Good there, the follow-up. Ooh, the last hit of that down air actually stopping Lax from approaching and stuffing out that combo. And Yaliso able to get out of it, and now Lax is the one at that dangerous percentage. Absolutely, but the percentage is going to be brought back together pretty quickly, and you're never too low against Fox. Fox can get the kills pretty easy if he finds the up smash, which... Uh... It's around the percent for Nair up smash right here, so that's always should be on your mind if you're fighting against Fox at, you know, 80, 90, 100. Uh, but there, once again, the backers in the corner is really something that Lax has to find a way to deal with because he's lost at least three stocks now to that very situation. And Yaliso, I mean, he's been throwing out that backer a lot, like you said, around that ledge. And it's found it's marked a number of times. That forward smash not going to land, and... Yaliso, oh, that, that counter ill-advised, and Lax sneaks underneath it to even things back up. Yeah, he could tell he was definitely really looking for that kill after he went for the forward smash, but he still managed to find it quick enough to make this game pretty much even right now. Yaliso into the corner here. That's the number of times that Yaliso has been able to actually kind of land on Lax and get his own kind of follow-up uh, off of it, you know, using the last hitbox of either Nair or Down Air to try and get something going and Lax right now he's just being chipped away at time and time again 
Exactly, you said it perfectly. Chipped away is exactly what's happening. Fox is the character who's supposed to hit you and get so much off of one hit. Like, perhaps we're seeing right here, um, whereas Swordfighter is a character who doesn't get nearly as much, and he's usually just going to go for one hit and then wait for, like, an opportunity to capitalize on advantage, like we see at the ledge and with some of the juggles. And here again, the same ledge play another time a back at ledge, but in this situation was actually on a full hop. Uh, and shoutouts to Yulisa's reactions partner in a lot of the situations. He being very good at covering options, but also dealing with things properly. In a previous interaction, we also saw him land with the back air and then react to the fact that Lax was trying to land on him with a nair and he went for an up tilt. So reactions and coverage, beautiful from Yulisa in the set. Something he's kind of made a name for himself for as this season has gone on. And Lax now... Struggling once again to try and find a way in. That's a number of times we've seen kind of an accidental footstool as he's landing on Yuliso. So no real follow-up off of it. Side B to try and break through is not going to work out. And Yuliso, again, just going to throw some projectiles to punish that one. And that percent just keeps getting worked away at. This is like death by a thousand cuts for Lax. Can he find a way through? Oh, he no, that was probably out supposed to be a back air. I think he wanted a back air and missed the bar, perhaps. I'm not sure if forwarder would have even killed there. But uh, in the corner again, can Lax avoid the legendary backer that's been killing him every time? He finally gets his way back on stage this time, and uh, not looking too good for Lax though right now. 138, it feels like he's working on borrowed time, but if he can take this stock off of the Yaliso, that would do wonders for this point differential. The side B connects, no up there, the back air doesn't land either. Very close for both of them. Up smash, pulled the trigger on it, but did not find its mark, and they're both you know, weaving around each other's shields. They know how important this stock is for that scoreline right now, even though it is only the second set. Elisa's doing such a great job baiting out these up smashes. I want to see him capitalize and just get the stock from one of them. He knows that Lax is looking for it. He knows that Lax really wants that kill. Definitely fine to kill any time that up smash. It's a shield, but that forward tilt just covering the side B, probably a little bit antsy from Lax wanting to get something started after pretty much no interaction happened for a long time. Going to Yuliso. So Yaliso takes that one via two stock, and because of that, things are all tied up at six apiece. Two points for the stocks, two points for the set victory. And that forward tilt, we really didn't see a ton of that yeah. move used in general from Yaliso, but I feel like there's something to be said about Fox in general just kind of tunnel visioning and wanting to find that kill, and Yaliso yeah. was ready for it. Exactly. I think he missed, mostly just threw it out in case Fox ran at him in it because I don't think he would be able to have time to punish it with like a nair in case he like jumped in. So it was just if Fox runs in for like up smash, dash attack, whatever, th this is a hitbox to check your potential. Yeah, and as we see in the replays here, this was again very close between the two of them, but Yuliso just continued to work away and Lax got caught time and time again. This was a good sneak under yeah. with that up smash yeah you, you get kind of stalled in the air with that down b something that like a lot of fox players might want to uh you know learn is that a lot of times i'm seeing lax go for his short hop up airs and he's fast falling them um but unless i'm mistaken if you fast fall fox's short hop up air it doesn't auto cancel and i think it's actually less laggy overall if you just do the short hop up air and then don't fast fall uh, i believe that's what you usually see from like top fox players when they're going for their upper ladders and that may be why uh, we didn't get to see too many i said like those were those were auto canceled but i think a lot of times he was missing the auto cancel off them from getting like bigger juggles with the uh the up air extension yeah and lax again one of the players for sienna that you know, this, this Fox has been, it is either, it's kind of hit or miss. It is, you know, either a, a snowball type of, of player where he can get a bunch of points on the board, or you have these weeks where it's close, but he just gets shut down in these key moments. And because of that, Yaliso is able to take advantage. There's also something to note about Yaliso, and I, we saw it a little bit in this set, but Yaliso is kind of known for his tricky movement and how yeah. elusive he is. And Sword Fighter not quite as elusive i think but it, you know it, it it's more shown for when he plays me gunner in particular he uses that forward air very well to space forward, out yeah. right but uh we saw in this set in particular just the fact that he had so many projectiles and he was able to you know keep his own space it made it very difficult for lax to you know do what fox does very well yeah and even the way that you describe Fox is kind of, or excuse me, Lax is kind of indicative or, or like descriptive of Fox itself, like being a character that's pretty inconsistent, stuff like that, for sure. 
Right, players for round three have been locked in. It is Chef for the side of Iona. Chef, 1-0 on the season. Last time we saw them, I believe, was just a week ago. They played Hero uh, and lost, unfortunately, for them. But we get to see them here in spot number three. They'll be going up against Bivers, who is the Falco player for Sienna Bivers. Six and five on the season, and one of the more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, grizzled veterans of this team. He's been here since year one, so we'll have to see how he does into this hero matchup. Yeah, I always like watching some Falco. You're going to see a lot of uh, hype combos, hopefully, anytime Falco's on this. Yeah, and again, for these two schools, this matchup could be uh, very impactful as the scoreline is tied, you know, whoever wins this set, they take the lead and it forces, yeah. you know, a very uh, important match number four. You know, you force that kind of response. Could you run away with it or could you not be you know, the, the way the point spread works? You could get a maximum of eight points or a minimum of four. So we'll have to see how these two do overall. I think Bivers, initially I'd give Bivers the advantage just because of the experience that he has. Mm -hmm. He's been here since year one and he's been kind of the go-to guy, especially early on in these sets. They usually send in Bivers first or second, but to put him here at third uh, is interesting to see. And against Hero too, yeah. Hero's a very different type of character. You have that menu, obviously, that's, his, that's a key portion of his kit. Well, that makes me think that Bivers, maybe the idea for this this type of matchup is don't give him the time to use that menu in the first place. Yeah, definitely. I think with this matchup, we're going to see Hero struggling to land a lot. And Falco is the king of anti-aerials between up tilt, nair, forward air. It's going to be hard anytime Hero with his relatively slow air mobility and um, a lot, not really any kind of crazy hitboxes below him to get back onto the ground against Falco. Um, Hero's Uppy is also pretty susceptible to Falco's down air, which is one of the best down airs for just going off and somebody in the game, you know, but it's Hero. There's always that menu factor. We really never know what we're going to see. Um, you were talking about this in game one. There's also the reflector, or excuse me, in the previous set. Uh, but actually, we're not seeing Hero at all. Looks like we're going to be seeing Boy uh, coming out here from, uh, and here we go. Chef opting for Roy this week, and we didn't see this last week, but... Roy, again, a very different uh, sword fighter compared to Hero. I think this one, in particular, Roy, uh, just in terms of this matchup, the pace of play is going to be a lot faster. The speed oh, yeah. of this character is going to be able to keep up with Falco a lot better. But it really does, I think, feel like whoever hits the opponent first is just going to be able to run away with it. Uh, that being said, Bivers is the one finding all the hits right now. 90 on the Chef off the start. Yeah, this is a super explosive matchup. A lot of edgeguard potential, too, as you see right there. Actually going for the uh, down B. Just shy on that uppy. Roy's uppy can have these weird phenomenons where it like looks like it's going to grab the ledge but doesn't, especially if you're not facing it. But just as we say that, ooh, that could have been some big damage, but it still is. Uh, Smashville also a great Falco stage because you can just shark that platform with the up tilt so well and get so many drag down setups on it as well. Jeff down, full stock here at the start. Bivers is the one on the ledge. Good side B to get back though. Is able to avoid. I believe that was a forward tilt from Chef and Bivers right now in pretty solid control. Just Chef kind of, at times it feels like he's just kind of swinging for the fences. I like the idea to use that side B to get back to stage. Exactly, and, and the bait with that side B as well uh, in neutral from, oh, and there's the perfect <laughs> spike. There's no other place for him to go in that spot. Bivers capitalizing perfectly and has a two stock lead right now. It's the second time we've also seen uh, Chef going for that roll in read with the forward smash. And uh, a lot of times Bivers is just kind of staying back and waiting for these kind of greedy options to find an opportunity and wonders. Ooh, that side B from Bivers is actually doing a lot of work. But as I say that, Caster yeah. Curse, the forward tilt from Chef comes out. And I was going to say, we haven't seen a lot of forward tilt from Chef, especially in those shielded scenarios. But that air dodge is not going to get you back to the ledge. And Bivers will take game one. Yeah, that feel like the game just started. That was instantaneous. Very, very quick game. But and that is also to be expected about the matchup anyway. Very explosive, both of them comboing each other, and we saw so many great edge guards from Bivers there. I think almost every stock was an edge guard, except for, uh, yeah, maybe it was every stock. We're getting one stock, but at least two of them were. 
getting down airs off stage. This unfortunately was, <laughs> as they always say, unfortunately was an SD. I'm not sure if uh, Chef thought they could make it from that distance, but either way, yeah, Bibber's taking that dominantly. Yeah, uh, dominantly. I mean, he gets the JV3 there, as I just saw, but uh, I mean, even from stock number one, Chef's at a big disadvantage here, and I guess this is technically an edge guard of sorts. Uh, you know, Chef just ends up drifting a little bit too far down. And like you said, that, that funky kind of angle of the up B, yeah. it feels like he should grab the ledge. If this were melee, it's he so probably would have grabbed the ledge. It's, you know what it is? He's got the sword in his hand. You can't grab a ledge with a sword in your hand. I guess that's what it is. Um, and also just like, yeah, like you said, definitely the fact that Vivers went off with that down kind of put, had forced him into a spot like that. If you look, the down B was extremely extremely close uh, to connecting that position anyway. But right here, I think we're gonna see the side B into back air. And I think this is where he finds that one down air. Yeah, cause you see Chef burned his jump pretty high up there. So it made it a pretty clear timing where we're able to find down air just like that and beautifully closes it out. He almost got it on the last stock as well. But uh, here's the stock that Bibbers dropped. And I was saying that he was getting a lot of mileage out of that side B, and I was yeah. going to compare it to, to Lax because those side Bs for Lax were, were not working for Fox. But here, Bibbers was just kind of able to break neutral a couple of times with it and get combos off of it. But uh, when, when push came to shove, it ended up <laughs> costing him the one stock. But still, it was a, a overall dominant game from Bivers, just able to to string together more hits. And, and it's not like Roy doesn't have a combo game in this type of matchup, oh, yeah. but it certainly, <laughs> yes. feels like, it certainly feels like Chef is struggling to, to find those combos a bit more. Absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because that one side B that he died for was actually sort of the same read. Like he's been doing the side Bs where he's retreating and baiting Chef to do a grounded option. And that's exactly what happened. Only the grounded option happened at the same time as the side B and killed him in that instance. Yeah. And uh, because of that, you know, he's able to to take that stock off the board. So as we get ready for game number two, oh, what's the key that you're looking for here for Chef to try and, you know, push this to game number three? I think basically just more patience, and especially with the side Bs, because that's been one of the biggest, like, big openings that uh, Bivers is giving, and you might as well take what you're getting first. I always tell people, you know, look what's, what your opponent's giving you for free before you try and force your way in with your own open. It's hard to see a little bit of that there as that combo got a quick 20 on him, and now you're starting to see Chef push forward a little bit more. That side B from Bivers won't connect, and percents relatively even off the start, but look at Bivers getting a lot of stop, excuse me, soft follow-ups and nearly finding an edge guard on Chef. There we go. That's exactly what I was talking about. Chef just stays right there. The side B comes right to him. And that's that beautiful punish. Basically twice in a row right there. Let's see what more he can do. Good up tilt into the back air, and it is enough to take that stock. Chef will fall. He was only at about 90 or so. That back air very strong and look the side b again connecting into that up tilt and chef getting a little bit of damage on his second stock there and bivers right now doing a fantastic job of despite being at high percents able to find his way back to stage time and time again yeah that up tilt backer is the textbook falco kill confirm especially when you're on town near the sides because the side blast zones are very close to the stage uh, that's the absolute number one thing you need to be aware of at those percents because that's exactly what every falco player wants to take your stock Rivers able to snap to ledge once more and just kind of holding shield and the quick turnaround on that side B to back air gets him out of dodge once again and Chef struggling to find a way to land one of Roy's many strong hits to try and take this stock. Falco is on the lighter side of the cast, so it shouldn't be that difficult, but the difficulty is Bivers is being hard to track down. That being said, the up B out of shield gets the job done and the stocks are even at two apiece. Nicely done. Yeah, I'd also like to see more grabs from Chef because a lot of times Bivers is throwing out a move and then holding block, although right there he just forward smashed twice in a row, so maybe trying to make me look <laughs> wrong. But uh, a lot of times, like right there, anytime that Chef finds himself close to Bivers, uh, he's just going for like a tilt or just some pressure on shield, which is good pressure, but it's not going to actually get anything done. And uh, his grabs will allow him to break through that wall in neutral. It almost feels like these upbees out of shield that we've seen from Chef a couple of times are just to try and kind of shift the momentum. Whereas 
like you said, a grab might be able to, you might be able to get more mileage out of it, but the upbeat is just kind of a, you know, get off me, I need time to, to think type of move. That Bivers really is not allowing, oh, I like the idea for that everything. downing where it doesn't yeah. quite land. Yeah, it's pretty tricky to edgeguard Falco. Like, it's a character that seems easy to edgeguard, but he has so many so many ways to mix it up because of how high his double jump goes. So uh, you really have to wait for Falco to like burn an option and then we're just hope he doesn't immediately recover. And then if he burns one defensive option, you can something. Or, or rather, you can punish the option they're going to do after that. Jeff done a lot of work on this stock. He's got him up to nearly 100. And Chef's still at 150. Bivers in the corner. The forwarder just gets around the F-tilt of Chef. And that was a kind of an awkward fade, but it ends up working out in Chef's favor. Up-tilt doesn't land, and both of them dancing around the shield once more. Forward air lands for Bivers. Edgeguard attempt number three. The down B again, just able to weave around it. And that up B won't be able to take the stock quite yet. They're both at such a high percentage. It feels like one move should be able to do it, but he doesn't get the strong hitbox of the up air, and Bivers escapes for the moment. Yeah, I think there he was trying to back air and just kind of realized that it was a little bit too late and just maybe pressed the wrong direction on the C stick or the controller, but, uh, or the control stick. But in a situation like that, it's actually really hard to get like the sweet spot of back air or even forward air, which might have been better there. But the up he had a shield. That's been doing a lot for Chef this game, and it is one of Roy's only ways to punish certain moves from Falco on shield. Falco's actually a very safe character on shield unless he like horribly misspaces a move that or minus than some of his other, his other moves. So. Uh, he's been using it in all the right positions, which I really like to see. Down tilt Down connects tilt. there. That was a... That, that one was close. I thought I saw an option come out there from Chef, but the down tilt beats it out, and things are back to even. But you're starting to see, you talked about it, that patience from Chef here really uh, coming through here to get a couple of these openings, and he's got the percent lead because of it. Yeah, as someone who personally fights against Falco all the time, I feel bad for what happened to Chef right there. Is he got up tilted on his shield, but he wasn't facing the same way, so he couldn't get the grab. And then up shield probably tried to turn around and like reshield the second one, but just got caught by the second one. And a lot of momentum right now for Rivers. Chef getting a little scared with these air dodges, uh, but at the same time, you know this is very close. I mean, edge guard here can close it out, but uh, Rivers being very patient every time he gets off the ledge, like we saw with the down tilt last time. A great option to just kind of take your time in the corner and let the other person overcommit, give you a chance to get back on stage. Ooh, that forward smash, very dangerous there from Bivers. Good forward air. Oh, that could be the... it. Ooh, that was nearly hit too off of the spike. Chef able to escape, but now they're both at relatively kill percentage. No back air there follow up, but the strong hit of the up air will do it. Chef takes the stock, and we're headed to game three. Beautiful from Chef. I also love the DI on that up tilt because if he went straight above Falco right there, the up air would have absolutely been the kill. Uh, Falco up air is not necessarily the strongest kill option, but when you go straight above him like that, there's nothing you can But he went too far off, and then uh, Bivers had to like run to the side and fall off the platform in order to get close enough, and he just wasn't able to get it. So that worked out very nicely. Those. Landing the, the strong hit of that up air. We saw him land the, the, uh, the sour spot of it earlier that match, but... I really do think what you said at the you know at the beginning of this game that patience was really the difference maker because Chef after dropping the first stock was able to battle all the way back and once he dropped the or once he got the lead he was able to hold on but there were times where it looked very scary and Chef was able to just kind of chip away at that lead at yeah, 90% when he got hit by the up tilt back air. No surprises to anyone who deals with Falco. The, the Falco just kills you. You're suddenly just gone. Uh, I think another factor also, and uh, I'm usually a person that doesn't pay as much attention to this as maybe I should, but the stage. Canon City is much bigger than uh, Smashville, which is where we went on. And it's very easy to get overwhelmed by Falco as soon as you get away from, you know, one like up tilt on shield below a platform, then he's just chasing you again or side being your landing and you don't really have room to breathe. On this stage, there were a lot more opportunities for Chef to get his footing back and find those openings and find his way out of the pressure. And I think that's exactly what we saw. Chef did make very good use of that upbeat. I think that replay in particular showed, I think Bivers dropped it at the same time that Chef dropped the shield to do that upbeat. But this, this second stock, I mean, for Chef to be at 175 and get 40% on the Bivers, that's a decent amount of extra credit. And even there, I like the idea to try and go for that down air to try and snipe him below the ledge, but just 
the Ford are not quite connecting in time, just not quite spaced properly, and the down tilt ends up catching the landing. Yeah, the forwarder was ridiculously close to catching the neutral get up, but you only have one frame of vulnerability before you can shield. Although in this case, he's not shielding. He's just, going for it. as you can see, it, the spacing was actually there. It, it, it clipped the model. It's just still in the iframe. That's wild. Uh, anyway, we're moving on to game three, I believe. Yeah, same matchup. And let's see what the stage pick is this time. Wouldn't have it any other way between these two. It's been very close. PS2, the site of game number three, and We'll have to see. I mean, PS2, kind of the neutral stage of this game, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> right now, it's... Bivers is the one taking a lot of the early hits here. He's trapped in the corner, and I like the use of Saibi that we're seeing from Chef. Yeah, and a lot of down tilts, too, just keeping the safe pressure up in the corner, keeping that roll distance covered. Uh, as we say that, though, the falling forward air, this is big. That, that well, even without the drag down, he's getting a lot off of it. Um, that's the thing about Falco is you, you feel like you have a lead and then you get hit once and it's even or maybe the Falco even has a lead So it's the thing that you always have to respect are his early percent combo options and then especially the up tilt when you're a kill percent uh, Which fortunately he isn't yet unless uh, Cooper's managed to find some kind of extended confirm probably wanted to pop through fair there oh, The second hit of up tilt <laughs> That's that's tragic he parry one but not the other and because of that you're still in the blender as Bivers tried to extend that combo but been shield into the grab back throw and not able to get much off of it though and oh, that's that gonna side be it. B, yeah that should do it that side be so strong I love the reaction to Bivers position he switched to the upwards hit on the third swing which is usually what you want to bring somebody into the right position to get sweet spotted by the last hit and that's exactly what Chef did and close out that first stock and then he got another quick 17 from the next side B on that second stock. Bivers, though. Yep, that's the up tilt in the back air. That last game, and that's the Falco Classic able to even things back up. Yeah, and that's one, that one's hurts to, to get hit by because I'm pretty sure it was like a tech chase and he just mistimed the punish on like a neutral getup or something. I could be remembering that completely wrong, but it wasn't like he just messed up and landed on top of Falco and got hit by the up tilt. Uh, just got caught by it in one little interaction and then first stock. Yeah, these up tilts, like, I mean, up B's, like you said, been catching. A is going out of shield a lot, or, like, just jumping out of shield doing other things. Oh, no! Doesn't get the angle on that up B. I'm pretty sure he could have made it, but there is sort of that pineapple effect on the bottom of PS2, which is especially annoying because you actually can't see that part of the stage. It's obscured. You have to hit that, that odd kind of slide angle yeah. in order to make it back from there, but could not do so and gets pineapple because of it. wonder if he had his jump there either. It looked like that's part of the reason he fell so low is that he might not have had it. Bivers is at 26 now on his last stock and trying to find a way to even things back up. And that laser, I feel like, is a, a crucial part of the game plan here. Continues to chip away at that percentage. And Zordies, just in general, I feel like tend to struggle with that projectile. Yeah, I will, just as he, I was about to say, <laughs> uh, if I'm Chef, I, I would not even care about the laser. You don't want to go near Falco at 86 when he's at the ledge because that is exactly what's going to happen. He's just He just wants you to jump over the lasers get up tilted and then get back aired and unfortunately for chef that's exactly what happened but and now Berber's back bringing this even and probably taking a lead with this combo does take the percentage lead but as you said things are just about dead even between these two trying to get those extra set points on the board but Bivers is able to land the combo once more the battle for stage control is on and Again, it just feels like it's a battle of the out of shield options. The, which one will land first, the up tilt or the up B? But Chef's got Bivers off stage here. Good ledge grab on that up B. And the pressure continues from these jabs. It's so threatening. So many quick options for both these characters. And yeah, those up Bs are doing a great job of avoiding the. Oh, no! Okay, that, he's not at the percent yet, but every time I see that up tilt now. Uh, that's really, really what Chef's got to be looking out for because Bivers knows his win condition. He's been using that kind of thing so well in so many interactions. Misses the double jump there. I'm not sure if that one would have been true, but he definitely had an opportunity. Uh, and now Chef falling out of the up tilt back air range. This is going to be a good opportunity for him to close out a side. Maybe a forward tilt here. Yeah, he's looking for it on the roll. Uh, greedy with that back air. Even if he crossed up, he probably would have gone off stage. I think that's what he wanted, though, was to cross up. Early up B preventing the down air. Very good from Chef right there. Huge early up B, but the pressure's still on. Both of these players at roughly 130. Up beat early, and that's gonna get punished. The up smash from Bivers takes the stock, and he takes the set, and Sienna's back in the lead. Yeah, great stuff to Bivers there. Both of them were kind of scrambling. Both of them knew this was do or die. But when it came down to it, Bivers 
held his own, he stayed patient, he held shield, saw the uppie, and capitalized on the opportunity perfectly. And talking about Bivers knowing his win conditions, that situation, maybe just waiting for any opening at that percent is enough to be your win condition. And I feel like that was the crucial thing across this set that Bivers did better. Yeah, and uh, it, it reminds me of what we saw kind of last set where when you have a very combo heavy character like like Lax's Fox or Bivers Falco here, it's so easy for you to tunnel vision on saying, okay, I just want to hit my opponent because I know how to convert off of it. But Bivers did a good job of, you know, showing that patience that he needs to say, hey, I, I just need to find the one mistake that he makes yeah. and then I can follow up off of it. And Bivers able to seal away the stock because of it. His, this is the early stock. This is stock number one where yeah, I'd be. Yeah, this side B is incredibly strong. Let's see that. You see the upswing there. I think I saw it on the second swing. And then uh, I'm not sure if that's forward or up on the third. But yeah, he, get, he gets the one up angle, which is it keeps you closer to Roy, which is what you want. So you can get that last hit. Um, and like you were saying um, about, you know, looking for things versus letting them come to you. It, it's something I, I say a lot when I'm coaching people is that it's... It, want to take what you have for free yeah, you see he used his jump there before he decided as well um sometimes you need to force your way in sometimes your opponent isn't committing to too much and you need to make an opening but if your opponent is giving you a chance based on the way they're playing their game don't even think about what you want just think about what they're giving you and take that opportunity just like we saw in the very last exchange when the up smash this second stock kind of goes back to what you were saying about oh yeah this knowing the air your, yeah knowing your win conditions and uh, you know, he jumped over the lasers, got caught by the up tilt, and Bivers knew exactly how to uh, capitalize off of it. So with that, Bivers takes the set for Sienna in a five-point fashion. So it is an 11-7 to scoreline thanks to game number two where Chef was able to get that one stock on the board. So only a four-point difference, which means that if, you know, Sienna wins this set by the minimal amount of points, we'll go tied into set number four. So... A crucial, crucial set for both of these teams is this set number four. If Sienna wins it by more than four, for Iona it becomes uncombackable. If Iona does, or if Iona gets a victory at any in any sort of fashion in this fourth set, then it's up for grabs in set number five. So uh, we'll have to see players being locked in. It looks like for Sienna they locked in Pango who has been kind of the staple name of Sienna 10 and 0 on the season and I think this season exclusively he's gone with the the Minecraft Steve pick uh this year and to counter him it looks like Iona will be sending in Moat Moat has been one of these players that's used the uh what's the term the Shoto fighters the the street oh, yeah. fighter characters the uh, yeah, we've seen almost, we've mostly seen Terry, but we have on rare occasions seen the Kazuya. So I'm curious to see which one he opts for in in a matchup where he's probably going to be going up against a Steve. Yeah, I like to call them fighties. That way nobody gets mad at you calling him Shotos <laughs> yeah. and then you, you loop them all together. You know, the you got aimbot characters as stuff. I joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> yeah, we could have some very interesting interactions if it's like Kazuya or something versus uh both of them just kind of touch of deathing each other in certain interactions. Um, very different from like a, a lot more fundamental based kind of matchup that we saw Falco and Roy up now fighty. And you, you never know what you're going to get when you find Steve. The characters becoming a lot more popular in the meta, which it's interesting to watch. I'll say that, I'll say that at least. <laughs> it, it is also an interesting uh, matchup when you look at the play styles. Moat in particular, he's very much when he plays Terry, and it kind of goes back to you know, what Terry does well, uh, there's certain things. Mo is absolutely one of those players that's, okay, I need to win neutral three times. That's all I need to do. And Mo, he wins neutral three times more often than not. I believe he is uh, six, yeah, he's six and four on the season because of it. And so if he can find those, you know, three or four neutral wins, yeah. Terry's got a lot of kill power in his oh, kit, yeah. and, and each combo does about 30%. So that, it's very much playing into that type of style, whereas Pango, he is a little bit more adaptive, I think. He, you know, you can play that kind of rush down and, uh, you know, land your up tilt combo type of, of Steve, or 
you can, you know, stay back, farm, force your opponent to try to come to you through those awkward block setups. And for Terry in particular, that could be very, very difficult to do so. Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking because you say you have a player who's just looking for those few neutral interactions, but if Steve wants to play a certain way, getting those interactions can be extremely difficult. And if you have them, there might be other obstacles in your way anyway that prevent you from getting the combos the way you want them to. I guess in Terry's case, that might not be the, the biggest factor because a lot of his simple jab can stuff won't really get disrupted by blocks. But there are a lot of interesting, uh, uncommon interactions that we'll certainly see, and uh, definitely interested to see. Uh, I believe you said it was Moat, right, as the, uh, the, the the fighty player, mm -hmm. how he deals with the obstacle course that Steve presents. And it feels like we're getting right into it now. I'm also curious to see. Uh, as we do see the Terry come out versus the Steve, one of the keys to Sienna, they are the defending MAC champions for the past two seasons. And one of the things for them has been the ability to edge guard, the ability to seal stocks early. And I feel like that could be ever present in a matchup like this, where you have so many, you know, different kind of ledge coverage options if you're Pango against a Terry that it's a lot harder to just quickly snap to ledge. Yeah, you can see Moat definitely familiar with the matchup right as he starts going for the power wave to put pressure on Steve if he tries to, like, start off with his mining and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as we say that, though, he's still certainly getting a lot of materials and uh, the burn knuckle not completely going through the block. Some big combo damage coming out right now from Pango. I was able to find that back air. That was clean to try and reverse the scenario here. And Go online now for Moat. We'll see if he's able to do anything with it. This is a lot of pressure on that shield. No power, guys. I'm actually kind of surprised that he didn't pull the trigger on that early. And Panko yeah. able to escape because of it. Yeah, very close to the time he actually did attempt it. Also, I like how uh, Panko just kind of like randomly upbeat to ledge. I think maybe he was trying to trump, but it just looked really funny. Ooh, oh, wow. That actually is going to take it. Or I'm shocked. I did correctly. <laughs> Not enough oh. mash on that though. That could be tricky. Sometimes you actually just die. Like it's actually pretty hard to mash out of that if you're a higher percent. And because of that, things are back to even. And just like that, one combo either way. And percents just continue. It, it is punch for punch here between these two. Just either one hit for one hit or three hits for three. And Moat right now disadvantage because of it. But look at Pango following through and getting the F smash on the on the follow as he had nowhere to really land. Hey, this game has been tons of interaction. Think of Steve, you think of a character that a lot of times is gonna be running away, but they've been at each other throughout the whole game already on last stock. Only, only about to hit the five minute mark. And I'm kind of surprised that side B uh, both times fighting through the cart. You saw Pango just wanted to try and buy himself some space with that projectile and he was unable to do so, but oh, that's a huge side beat from Moat. He was without a jump. That could have been very dangerous. Still might be, and once again, that side beat early gets him out of dodge. What I'm interested to see here is how the players play differently when it's kill percent for last stock, because I feel like they've been kind of just taking risks, going at each other, and what happens but now it's really do or die if you lose a stock here the game's over so there's going to be a lot more patience most likely as they interact but right now it's pango who has to be more defensive because he's at 125 uh moat really not slowing down on his offensive only 52 percent on moat like you oh. said and a chance with a backer right there Pango playing very carefully around the outskirts of the stage. That down B won't connect, but the quick turnaround into the up yeah. B will do it, and Moat takes game one. I'm interested if, uh, is that really, was Steve not able to do anything out of shield to punish that power dunk? Because he landed right behind him. I wonder if that was just like a late reaction or if it's actually that plot. I know that move can be hard to punish, but yeah, I, th I think he definitely tried to do something, which is why he dropped shield, but then <laughs> that's exactly what Moat wanted as he found that jab into up at the stock. The down B actually ended up crossing him up too, so Pango had to kind of turn himself around and he wasn't able to do so. So Moat takes game one, but like you said, there was just a, a ton of action between these two. It was yeah. really just, everything felt like a trade, even though it was combo for combo or, or you know, one hit for one hit. It was always just back and forth. And it, was, it ended up being Moat who was able to, oh. to find one more hit than Pango was. It looks like here, uh, Pango air dodged uh, when he got hit to the butt. Because I didn't think this power dunk should have killed like mid stage. If you look, uh, like right as he's in the little bubble there, you can see 
eventually. A couple more, and yeah, there. It uh, looks like a neutral air dodge, though. I'm, I don't know. I, Steve has weird animations, but I'm pretty sure that was an air dodge. Either way, though, that that definitely closed out one of the stocks, uh, as we saw many of them going very quickly. Now uh, you said both of them, uh, or no, it was at least Moat has multiple characters. I wonder if he'll stick with Terry for. Or if we'll switch it up. I think Terry of the fighties is definitely one of the best to go for because one of the faster fighting game characters. Ken is also kind of quick, but something like Kazuya, a pretty more sluggish character that might he might not opt for that, or he might. We'll see. And Kazuya also has that projectile that could potentially, you know, snipe through the blocks depending on the setup that Pango goes for. But it is the Terry for game two. The up tilt combos start to land here for Pango early in this one, but. Small yeah. battlefield to site, and I actually think this plays a little bit more to to Moat because it's going to force more interactions, and that's what Moat's been thriving off of, just those few quick combos that he's been able to get. Yeah, and I was, as we saw there, Moat kind of just decided to back and, uh, and let Steve mine, and sometimes it's just like easier for your mental to do that, but you really don't want to give him that opportunity. Just enter his space and bait him to do something. You don't have to hard commit, you know, when he's mining and everything. Oh, power down right in. Oh! Okay, <laughs> back air out of hit stun. So wow, this, this, I can't even say what happened because it's all it's all going too quickly. Um, super explosive set, continuing into game two. My jaw dropped. I can't believe Mo got that back air off in time, and then Pango was able to answer right back just shortly after dropping down from Halo. So on the second stock, I guess. But Mo at 62% here. He's got Pango above this platform and Pango is the one finding the momentum here and Moat's up to 90 but when Go comes online be weary but he may not have the time to use it he's barely able to get back to stage. Yeah and he's just kind of respecting the wall of blocks there again uh giving Steve the time to mine more his different materials and everything and that wow well, that back there he was in front of him but boxes there you go and now Pango taking probably the the biggest lead we've really seen in this set so far. Yeah, no, absolutely. Largest lead between these two in particular, and Pango looking to try and continue. And I think part of the reason he picked this stage you're seeing is that he's really making use of these platforms. When he's on one moat, just doesn't have a, a clean way to approach. And that, that was, was nearly spike the spike off stage. Off stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything's falling apart for moat right now. He can't seem to get in, and anytime he gets close to uh, Pango, Pango's just finding the right angles to get his hits and avoid whatever Terry wants to do. Uh, respecting the power guys are there on the platform. A lot of up is coming out from now. That's something that, yeah, uh, if you're Moe, you can just wait and find a punish on that. I'm almost surprised he didn't uh, die from that because Steve is really light. Steve is one of the few characters that can actually kind of thwart the re-grab situation because when he lands on the block and grabs the ledge again, he gets his invincibility. But after all that, he just gets power geysered. And uh, not, not impossible now for Moe. We're, we're on stock right here. But he jumps into the up smash. That thing is very active and it's the last hit that you want to avoid. So game two going to Pango. That whole last sequence felt like one big mind game that just ended up being Pango's favor, right? He stalls out offstage for so long, and all I could think in the back of my head was, why doesn't Moat just run up and, and power guys? Yeah. Right? I'm pretty sure that move can cover just below the ledge, and that's what he ended up doing. And then, like you said, the up smash comes out, and that lingering hitbox is the one that connects and seals Moat's last stock away but that got very dangerous towards the later stages because once that go came online those kill options became more and more powerful and this was the first stock this I was the this. wild interaction off the tnt how does moat survive off the tnt and then how does he know to just throw out that back air as pango's hunting him down it's crazy because assuming they want to commit they both ob objectively did the right thing like uh, Pango also went for a back air, which was the right area. Like, he couldn't sneak under and get an up air or anything, and the back air also would have killed in that spot. Um, but I think that, uh, Mo like, Terry's back air just came out first, and that resulted in a pretty awesome interaction. I think overall in this set, what we saw, uh, and this could also be partially related to the characters that they're playing, but they were both kind of at each other's throats, both really aggressive in terms of, like, going for kills and going for big damage and everything like that. But when it came down to the times when they needed to actually be defensive, Pango had it and Moat didn't. And at that point also, you know, this was sort of like based on the second stock. Pango takes a big lead and then Moat really couldn't do anything about it. Uh, at that point, really, he has to be. 
Here's another look at that back air. Uh, I guess the <laughs> last hitbox. I, I, I'm going to say. Try to explain it. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like that in itself. This image right here shows you the <laughs> the whole story of just if your moat. I mean, what would you do wrong? Uh, I guess the, the, don't be on the platform. Uh, oh, oh well, Pango will uh, take the win and. As we said, get into game number three here. I'm curious to see what the stage choice is. If Moat wants something like an FD where there's nowhere to, to run, and yep, that is the site of game number three. Yeah, exactly. Like we talked about earlier, it's just anytime you're dealing with projectiles, hiding under a platform can be, or not even just projectiles, but Steve doing his, his mining and whatnot. Uh, platforms can offer you a, a safety umbrella. Well, I guess Steve can do that with his blocks too, but. Uh, there'll definitely be fewer opportunities for him to avoid that kind of thing. On a couple of times, Moat has tried to get around that wall. Oh, that's the spike, but he will be able to survive. Not quite at a high enough percent for that spike to be deadly yet. Yeah, I like oh. how Endo didn't even try to like close out the edge guard. He's just like, I'm going to use this as time to get materials. That's what he did. Look, let her see. Um, <laughs> oh, wow, bouncing off the blocks. Yeah. It, Oh, Pango has just found the way to keep him out, and Moat seems like he doesn't have any answer to get through it. That might have been a shield poke. His shield was tiny. It was very, very close, and Moat, no time to use his go, go meter, uh, lost oh it God. via that stock, and look at the follow through. The TNT also landing. Moat's back to 112, and I don't think he's really touched Pango this stock maybe once or twice at the beginning. It is all Pango right now in game number three, but this is a big combo. Buster Wolf doesn't connect Oh, in that time. parry might have saved his shield. And there were, we actually saw a backer that would have killed Moat, but the blocks actually saved him. And something I love from Pango is he's actually doing a great job of mixing up when he's deciding to, like, mine and camp. Uh, oh, well, enough mash there again. And when he's actually just mixing it up and running in its uh, base and pushing. It's really hard for Moat to get any momentum. Power Dunk won't take the stock quite yet. This is a massive stock lead in general. Pango still at three and Moat on his last one. We've seen some crazy comebacks in the past, but this one feels real rough as Moat's already up to 80. Good parry on the court smash, but he can't quite get the punish. Oh, the cross up. At this point, Pango's just styling on him, honestly. Like he's, he's just literally building houses around him, trapping him in shield, trying to break his shield. Um, but sometimes you don't want to get a little too confident because you never know, your, your opponent might figure things out with that additional time you give them. Uh, that doesn't look pretty likely though right here. Okay? Use the Buster Wolf. Oh, but the side B will catch him. It's not going to be the stock quite yet, but that TNT, that's going to be a harsh spot. He will be able to get around it, but there is just so many options on the board for Pango. So many ways he could try and take the stock. Moat has to play so careful here at 132. And the back air, not going to do it quite yet. Again, good DI. will survive. It gets around. This is another bit of damage coming through. But can that shield pressure so deadly? The last hitbox again. And Pango just continuing to make things difficult for Moat. Yeah, difficult in so many different ways. Uppy is the pivot grab. Uh, I think we saw the, the last time Moat may have lived because of the directional air dodge where we expect that there may have been a death for the air dodge. It, it's weird to know when you can air dodge to survive and uh, get hit off. It's not going to be enough. And he, even if he does get this stock, he needs to take another one. Let's see. Oh, I think that might have been a power geyser miss input right there because it's the same kind of spot where he did it last time and it worked. But there's the power geyser and it does close out the stock. So Ango is not going to be feeling too good uh, <laughs> if he loses this after having such a huge lead. But as I say, at the up smash is going to close it out. Mogumoburoku. Is the game. <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said in this format, stocks do matter, right? Like in terms of uh, how it comes out, or am I mistaken in that? Yes, yeah, so every single stock matters. So that was a one stock victory. So he gets only a point, but he did win the set, which gives him an extra two points on the board. So that will put Sienna at 15 points overall right now. And Iona will only be at eight. So because it was such a small margin of victory in that third game, it does mean Iona can still win and we could potentially have a a tied set, but it would take a, a massive effort from Iona. A seven point difference means you'd have to 
practically play perfect. The, the maximum amount of points you can earn in a set is eight. So they can really only afford to drop one stock in the next two to three games. We're going to see that shield poke, I think, again, or perhaps a different Ooh. scenario. Yeah, yeah, right here. Um, once again, look how tiny that shield is. Yeah, that hits Terry right in the head. Well, that's easily going to be a shield poke in that situation. Um, but yeah, almost almost more like style or disrespect, if you will, from Pango. Um, considering how much the stocks matter, actually kind of playing with his food like that, uh, messing around. I mean, who knows? Maybe he was just trying to play the same way the whole time and close it out. But I definitely think if he really, really wanted the three stock, there are at least a different way he could have played to try and that. Um, but that's either way, still a, a big lead, at least a decent lead. Is uh, forward smash almost connecting? You see a lot of a lot of Terry players get away with bloody murder with their their power dunks. Um, that move definitely not as much lag as you would think based on the kind of move it is. It's certainly very punishable and is actually not something you want to spam uh, by any means. But especially when we're in an online environment. You can get away with a lot, which is pretty good considering it's a move that converts into a lot of things. And if you're late on punishing it, exactly what we see right here happens. You get jabbed, and that's Terry's number one combo starter. Well, uh, down tilt maybe, but jab is a huge reward for Terry. So, oh. I know, can't it's funny believe I... that, that Pango forward smash didn't get there in time. Yeah. <laughs> and even, or like even dodge it with the, uh, with the hurtbox. It kind of pulls back, as a lot of characters do. I was going to say, uh, based on the, the tags of both of these players, if I read moat, I might have expected that to be the Steve. You're building a moat around your opponent. <laughs> I guess you would need some water for that, too. Well, either way, it was very close between these two. Pango, with that uh, victory, he advances to 11-0 and on the season so far. And, uh, I mean, the perfect record stays alive for him, and he's been a huge portion of why Sienna has had such uh success this season as you see that's how he ended the that final game with the up smash and we saw a couple of times that's what uh moat fell prey to in this set just uh terry being a little bit too tall he caught above pango one too many times but i mean it was really a, a like you said this one actually reminded me more of an kind of an explosive set with how many interactions there were between the two of them yeah yeah, not necessarily what you'd expect if you see a Steve, a Steve set. All right, players are being locked in for the last set here. It looks like Knight will be the player for Sienna. Knight has been uh, one of the classic anchor players for Sienna time and time again. He's played Shulk exclusively uh for the past two seasons he's five and two so far this season and he'll be going up against rat king and and rat king uh I'll, I'll use a similar intro to as i did last time rat king i don't like to talk about tiers a lot but rat king seems to be be the king of the low tiers we've seen little oh. mac we've seen king k rule we've seen bowser jr in the past and He's four and three on the season, but his wins have been, again, very, very big when they come. So we'll have to see how he does against kind of the final boss of Sienna. Yeah, um, Oak, I'm really interested to see. It's a character that is very polarizing with the understanding that everybody agrees he's really good. But Shulk is a character that some people will be saying he's as good as like top three best in the game. Uh, and then other people like myself are just like, yeah, he's a solid high tier. And the thing is, we really don't get to see too much representation of Shulk at the absolute top level. But uh, perhaps, you know, we could be seeing the buds of a, of a future top Shulk right here. Um, always a really interesting character to see as well. A lot of interactions with that shield Monado art in particular, getting out of combos that would be for the character in the cast. Um, and then on the other end, I guess we don't really know what to expect from Rat King, right? So we're probably about to find out. The yeah. Little Mac making an appearance once again. I think the Little Mac is his more staple character. We've seen it more times than not. And that immediately makes me think, uh, you know, about the KO punch. That's kind of the the big portion of his kit is that ability to take stocks so quick off of just a button press. But that being said, Knight is going to be the one really in control of the pace of the matchup through the early portions of this game. 
Yeah, and you see starting right off with Speed, speed Monado, definitely something that you Shulk players will usually do anyway, but especially against Little Mac, who has one of the fastest ground speeds, really want to be able to keep up with him, and he's going right back to speed, just as I say that. Both times going low on the edge guard with the fair, but um, that king has gone high. So he might want to go reading high. Reading high is just a, a safe option in general, because even if you're wrong, your opponent, uh, you still get back on stage before your opponent does. Oh, did you, did you just burn the KO punch? It burned it real early. So that's KO punch off the board for seemingly a decent period of time. And Smash Art, yeah, Rat King is just kind of staying away from that one. At 99, you do not want to mess with that massive sword in Smash Art, especially with how difficult it is for Little Mac to, Little Mac to recover in the first place. Exactly, exactly. Like, a beautiful read on the air dodge there. Even if you don't kill somebody with Smash Art at that point, Mac is getting sent so far off stage that he'll, he'll either be really easy to edge guard or he just might not make it back anyway. And with that first stock off the board because of the air dodge read, Buster Art coming out online and wanted to get possibly a little bit more percent, but Rat King played him honest there. And so Knight only at 82. And now you, you start to look at Rat King and wonder how he's going to be able to take this stock because Knight's just doing such a good job right now of controlling the stage and not making it easy for Rat King to get in in the first place. Yeah, I love how he started off with Buster there because at this point, Little Mac has to approach. And uh, that just makes it anytime you try and get near him, you're going to take even more damage. Later. Great use of the Monado Arts in general to play around everything that Little Mac is trying to do. And neutrally, he's keeping with speed most of the time. And oh, I think he just took his jump with that Nair, and that's a stock. Yeah, that's a Little Mac stock. And Little Mac not really able to, to snap the ledges cleanly. And with that big of a sword, that is going to be a problem to deal with. Knight at 111, but he's done his job. He's taken two stocks off the board, but that up B will answer right back. So there's one stock at least going in favor of Sienna, but still a lot of work to be done. And that is what a Max Darius confirms because a lot of Max will go for like down tilt into an air dodge read, which we saw from Rat King earlier. Uh, which usually conditions the opponent to jump, but if you're jumping, you're more susceptible to getting hit by that up B unless you're just not at a percent where it's going to post a combo. So. That does bring things closer, and with the KO Punch almost coming around, if we can take this stock pretty quickly, we will have a theoretically even game. Yeah, beautiful Ooh. using the armor. He wants to save this KO Punch. He doesn't want to use it on this stock. Let's see what he gets. Oh, no, oh, that's you, not. You no punish, the... though, he keeps it. That's big. That KO Punch is going to run out of time, though, relatively soon. You got to wonder if he just wants to burn it to try and take the stock. And yep, that's exactly yeah. what happens. Run up and up B, or run up neutral B. Seals the deal. Counter gets him back to stage. So stock's even here. And this is where things get dangerous. There's a lot of kill power in both of these kits. Absolutely. As you can see, like... If he doesn't get a parry or armor through something, Rat King is having so much trouble dealing with the spacing from, from Knight. Because even without all that range, if you're spacing really really well against Little Mac, it's not like he has like the best out of shield options to deal with you. But when you have a giant sword like that, it's so hard for a character that relies on just his distance to do anything about it. Oh, he saved him, but no new attack, and that's going to be game one. Yep, like he said. It is Knight taking game one via only one stock, but it was a lot closer than I think he anticipated. And so Sienna get another point on the board. And with that, I mean, that forces a, a well, nearly unwinnable scenario. Rat King, the only way Iona could come out with a victory here is if Rat King gets two three stocks in the next two games and the way these two are oh playing that is a gargantuan task uh especially with how close this game was in particular yeah so knowing rat king's roster do you think he's going to stick it with the mac when that's a character that can just kind of die to almost anything if the cards are played right uh will he switch it up does he what's what's the play here I think the Little Mac is his most practiced, and yeah. I'm a fan of, you know, when your back is against the wall, go with the tried and true, even if it's rough. But, I mean, you look at the rest of the cast that he's played, you see Bowser Jr. and King K. Rule in the past, and I'm not necessarily certain those are much better. Maybe King K. Rule because 
he's a little bit bigger of a body and he can survive a little bit longer and you still kind of get that that raw kill potential but yeah. overall you're still going to struggle with the same things that you did in this matchup which is shulk's sword is just so big and it's just going to chip away at you for for so much damage that you're going to have to continue this type of play style where you look for one or two openings and you capitalized off the back of them. Yeah, definitely. It seems pretty dire no matter who he chooses, but maybe we'll see something exceptional. I'm looking forward to it. Game number two between these two. And remember, Rat King needs a perfect game here if Iona's going to come out with any chance of a victory this week. But Knight looking to ice that here in game number two. Battlefield the site and Little Mac is the, the character that Rat King will be riding out here. And things in Rat King's favor off the start. A lot of damage on the board of Knight right now. Hey, Rat King's been playing this very slow, very defensive, or, well, as I say, he goes for a big read there, but not trying to rush in and be too greedy. Um, and being a lot of, uh, showing a lot of respect to the Shulk aerials that have been netting so much. Of and I'm curious how Rat King is going to try and break through uh, kind of the neutral game, because like you said, Knight's spacing has just been really solid and aside from armoring through it's been very difficult for racking to really get anything going and armoring through while it is good if you're trying to play that type of perfect game to win this set it just means you're gonna get your percent chipped away at time and time again it's so difficult knight is spending pretty much any time he's near racking he's in the air and that relies on Mac to basically wait for him to get close enough or like low enough. And by that time, he's already at a distance facing his disjoint. Such a difficult situation. I, I think Wrecking has been doing the best that he can, though. Uh, I've seen two really great spot dodges, too, when Knight went for uh, a really good mix-up of just running in and grabbing, uh, like we saw there as well. Uh, and that high recovery netting is so much for Wrecking, including the stock right there, actually. That was huge, able to get around the forward air of Knight and then reverse the scenario onto him, but now he's got to deal with Smash Art, and at 91, he's going to play around these platforms. <laughs> yeah, that was a very good stall out from Rat King to get around there and burn that Smash Art. That could have been the stock if really any of those moves connected. Oh, that's it. Yeah, he jumped. And I guess that's the win, right? Do we count JVs? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, unfortunately not, but that is technically the win. They will continue to play this out, though, because of uh, potential uh, tiebreaker uh, implications down the line when we get towards the playoff race right. and whatnot in the next couple of weeks. But we'll see if Rat King can kind of mitigate the damage that has been done off of the back of this loss. Meanwhile, Knight continuing to work away at this stock he's got 56 on the rat king which is kind of a lot of percent when you're dealing with little mac and yeah we almost kind of work his way all those arts i'm pretty sure we almost saw a shield break earlier uh he did like a, a normal angled forward smash where the shield was pretty small i think if he did the down angle that'd have been a miss input uh that down angled forward smash from little mac they even buffed the shield damage does i think It'd be very strong air knight actually waiting for the high recovery but unable to punish the neutral air oh i didn't grab ledge from that okay he's still fine though that was a very tense scenario both ways. <laughs> Even right before the KO punch came out, uh, Rat King was off stage once again, and they both just kind of stared at each other as Rat King ended up falling back to stage. Just the mind game of, are, is he going to swing? Who's going to who's gonna pull the trigger first on their move? And then you saw the KO punch come out and whiff, but now with Rat King off stage, that was a big spot dodge to get around yeah, that grab, but that's a counter what? that actually gets him back to stage. The hitbox doesn't connect onto Rat King, so he survives for the moment. He's that back to the ledge once That's again. That's so sad. <laughs> yeah, again, uh, like you said, Rat King's so good with these spot dodges. It's, it's, it's not like Knight is going for a lot of grabs. He just knows exactly when Knight is going for the grabs. I love it. So maybe oh if my he was goodness. Yeah, where do you go? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that falling upper pressure. That was a really good... I think that was a read by Knight because if you remember the last time he had Smash Art on, Rat King almost exclusively just jumped around yeah. the platform. Yeah. He almost never touched the base stage. And so he said, okay, if that's the game plan for the second time around, let me, you know, go ahead and use that, that up there. It's Rat King armoring through once again to take that stock and get things back to even here in game number two. Yeah, and that was the upward angled forward smash, which I really like because it completely mixes up your opponent's DI. If they're expecting a regular forward smash, you're going to hold in, and that's exactly the DI you don't want if you want to live the uh, upwards angled forward smash. That KO punch is going to come online any second now. There it is off of the Nair, but 
I, will, this could be, will this? All right, it's too high percent anyway. I was just thinking, what happens if you get hit with uh, KO punch with Smash Art? Will you die at zero because you you take more knockback as well as Shulk with Smash Art on? But he's already past that percent anyway. This counter actually finding its mark. Little Mac off stage again. One of the first times we've seen him use the uh, the, the neutral beat to turn armor through things. I believe it's percent based armor that increases in the percent that it can tank as your percent grows, and the forward throw with Smash Art putting Mac in a very bad position. And like that, covering the high recovery there, closing out. This is a good that was result. clean by Knight. That was, I, I mean, if I had to describe Knight's playstyle with Shulk, historically, it's been kind of a, a, a dissection of play, right? It's just been, all right, I, I know what my character does well. Now let me see how I can enforce that onto other players. And here, Rat King gets grabbed. The, the switch to Smash Art right beforehand was so yeah. quick and clean from Knight, and then the second that Smash forward throw comes online, he knows, okay, this Mac is out of options. I just gotta wait for him, and, you know, essentially go down the checklist and clean up that second game. Exactly, and uh, with the Smash Art, that's the, sadly like the one time where Rat King didn't read the grab approach and spot dodge. I think the Smash Art also gets kind of conditioning. It's like, oh, I don't want to get hit by a forward tilt here. You know, I don't want to get hit by a falling aerial, but then, I found that perfect opportunity to get that grab. Uh, even though, as we said, it was uh, it was more than just the grab that took the stock, but the grab was the crucial factor. There we see that beautiful up air pressure. I, I love the way he's just painting a picture with these hitboxes right here. It's so yeah, threatening. Like you said you see the jump there. Boom. Just the edge of it, uh, or the tip of it, ended up connecting. And then... This is where Rat King was able to answer back here. He armored through, I believe, one of these is right there. Yep, and I believe, was that forward? Or, yes, that was forward smash, right? Oh, let me see it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the upwards angled forward smash. That's yeah, right. That's the thing I was talking about before, because um, as, as far as I know, you know, that's just like a regular upwards move where you would want to hold away from Little Mac. But you're getting hit by a forward smash. You can't really, I guess you can react and he's like angling his fist upward, but it's really good for mixing up the, I think that's why a lot of Mac players will opt to go for that at kill percent. That's also what it's going to kill off the top as well. And with that, Sienna get the victory. They win 19 to 8 over Iona. And, uh, a solid victory for the defending MAC champions. They are you know, still one of the teams that are in the upper echelon of the EGF. Only one loss this regular season. Iona, they fall to 6-7, and seven, which is rough, but, I mean, there's still three weeks left of the regular season for them to try and work their way back into the playoff spot. Plus, they've still got the MAC. Uh, championship coming up in just a couple of weeks. So with that being said, we will cut to a short break here to get an interview. Looks like we'll be hearing from Knight from Sienna after the break. Don't go anywhere.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the EGFC. We are here with Knight after their victory over Iona this week. Knight, how do you feel about your team's performance this week? Oh, feeling great. Everybody did pretty well. Um, mostly everybody won their matches, so we're feeling great. Yeah, congratulations, dude. That was really impressive stuff from that game. Uh, we were talking about how Shulk is a character that has sort of a, a polarizing place in the metagame with some people putting the character all the way up in like top three. Other people put him down like closer to the high tier. I was just wondering, uh, you know, as a main of the character, do you fall into this camp of people who super believes in the potential of your character? Or do you feel like you're doing your best out there with a character that people are overrating? Oh, definitely. I definitely think Shulk is a top tier character. He is very good, especially with Monado Arts. Like, Monado Arts make the character. There's also some hidden tech that I've been practicing myself. I'm not super great at it yet, but um, Shulk is a top tier character. Um, arguably one of the best when mastered. But um, So, I'm up there with, like, he's top tier. He's really good. Glad to hear so it. I like when mains have the, the faith in the character. Is yeah, certainly a, uh, a high ceiling for, for this character. Uh, Knight, you in particular are one of these players for Sienna that uh, you are typically one of the last players to go in the lineup, which means you get a lot of the very difficult matchups, especially with Sienna being in a lot of kind of close matchups this year. What's your mindset going into a lot of these, you know, very close fifth slot matchups? Um, when it comes to that, like I, I put myself, I said, I told uh, Mike that, our captain, that, yeah, I want to be last. I know I can do it. It's like, I go into it knowing that I can, I go into it like knowing I can be everybody here. I can do it. If you need a pinch, I can do it. I play a character that can do stupid stuff and put into a situation that can just like turn it around out of nowhere. So I'm just like, if you need a character to do it, Shulk, Shulk and me, I can, I can do it. Just go always into it. Like I can do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, you know, coming from, I'm pretty newer to the uh, EGF stuff, so I haven't seen all the, the history behind this. Um, but I'm not sure how many times, if you've played Rat King before or whatever, but it seemed like Rat King, uh, although you had the advantage throughout that entire set, he always knew when you were going to go for a grab. Is that something you took note of? Is like anytime you went for like, which I, in my opinion was a good mix up after, in the, uh, you know, with all your spacing, then you would suddenly just go in for a grab and he spot dodged almost every time, except for the last crucial time when you got him off stage uh, and prepared for the edge guard that sealed out this. Yeah, yeah, I was able to get him on the last one there. Um, yeah, those those grabs are supposed to be mix-ups. I feel like it was just more of him like seeing me approach grounded, and then if he yeah. saw me go grounded, he would just immediately spot dodge. But at that last tense situation, he it was like in Smash. That time I was in Smash Art, and I, I never went for the um, grab at the ledge, so he probably just wasn't expecting it. Yeah, perfect time so, to. Have. So that's probably where where I was able to get the grab. But um, most of the time, when I just like ran it at him like at a straight line, he would probably just assume, oh, he's gonna grab me, or he's not gonna do an aerial this time, and then just spot dodge. Exactly. Right. Uh, you guys now with this victory, you are twelve and one on the season overall, uh, and you guys have the MAC championship coming up in just a couple of weeks. Uh, how have you guys kind of prepared for, for the playoffs? What's the expectations of, of your guys' team this year? Uh, we're feeling pretty good about it. Uh, we feel like we would do, seeing how um, Max Championships is going to be offline, we feel like we're going to do extremely better, especially with our characters. Fox, not an online character. Yeah. Uh, Falco does better um, offline. Uh, Shulk does better offline. Like, all of our characters, they do better offline. So we're feeling really good about this. We think we can, like, take the whole thing again. Um, we're, we have full confidence going in doing well online then getting to play offline i feel like it just gives you so much more like now we can even play even better and we're already doing well enough yeah uh it helps with out with my spacing it helps out with uh falco combos fox stuff just reacting it, it's nice just to play offline especially for finals this time around absolutely so soy did you have any more questions or should we go to shout outs no, I think that's it. Knight is the, you know, you have, we're going to give you the microphone here while you're with us. Is there anyone you would like to shout out or thank while you're here? Uh, shout out to the whole teams. They played great this time. Um, other than that, just shout outs to the whole team. They all did great. All right. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we will see you guys next week when you guys play Kinesis. K excuse me. Kinesis. Should be a fun one. Yeah, thank you. Look forward to it. 
All right, and with that, we will be cutting to a short break to get ready for our second match of the day. When we come back, it's a rematch, essentially, of DePaul versus Colorado, the Independent Conference Championship here in Week 13. So don't touch that dial now. We're just getting started. 